Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to episode three of Chirping Zebras. I'm Mark Riley, alongside Gene Obinda, and uh, we're happy to have you. And tonight is a special night. We got a great guest tonight, and we'll get to that in a minute. Well, you can see the spread. You can tell it's Italian night. Oh, yeah. Yes. And um, we're coming here from AOA Studios up in Beverly, and uh, we're, we're so happy to be here. Moby Cuts, as always, is one of our sponsors, along with Referees Crease. Yeah. So Absolutely. we're um, so we're in for a great night. You said you had a story to share. I do, yeah. So remember, I called you on the way home from last week, right? Yeah, yeah. So we get, I'm getting on the on ramp, and I just like boom, guy in front of me just hits the brake, and then I look, and I'm like, ooh, five five cars just piled up on the on ramp, and like they're like flashing. And I'm like, ooh, baby. So I call you, give you the heads up. <laughs> you continued on elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, boom, off we go. So now I'm on the ride up. You know, the branch we split, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm pulling up. It's slow traffic, right? So I just see I just see blue lights everywhere. I'm like, what the hell's going on? So it's like, you know, Braintree splits a triangle, right? So yeah. I see lights ahead going towards like Braintree, right? And then I see a bunch of lights getting on the on-ramp going towards Boston. There's like three, four cruises. And I'm like, oh, something's going on. Then I see a trunk up, five, six stadies out. And then I see about five or six more on the other side. They had like they had the whole perimeter off. They, some shirt, the dog. I hear the dog bark, and I roll the window down. They're like, "Oh, you got him!" Never That's seen crazy. it before. Never seen a like almost like a. They had like a perimeter set around, and like, what did a guy like drive and like get out of the car and start running? Like, I, I have no idea, but I've never seen that in my life. Maybe there were the there was creatures from Florida <laughs> came to the South Shore Plaza. <laughs> yeah, right? who knows? Yeah, you don't know. You don't know all kinds of crazy shit going on. Yeah, but right up, right home uh, last week, saw the pile up, and this week's our, uh, you know. I'll be honest, I'm glad we're not driving together. Yeah, no kidding. Because uh, I was going to meet you in Braintree. <laughs> yeah, well, not anymore. Not what you're like. Yeah. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you, I walk in, that's a nice sweatshirt you got going you on. You like this? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, this is sweet. I got, it's got the, the B on the side. I know his refs sweet. were supposed to be impartial, but yeah. fuck that. Dude, um, I'm a Bruins fan. Yeah. I, I got this, get this, I got this at uh, the CCM house. Mm. So I did the CCM house back in yep. November. CCM takes over this house in Canton. And um, uh, Gabe and Kelly Barati are the owners of the house. They have a rink in their backyard. I mean, full-on compressors and everything, right? So CCM takes over the house. They build a barber shop in the place. And that's where I met Cam and Eric from Moby Cuts. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, that's how we got, you know, got hooked up here in this great studio. And um, they get the rink out back, and I ran a chirping clinic all weekend. I taught kids how to talk shit to that each other. Been, that must have been tough. It was, it was <laughs> hilarious when I had, like, the six- and seven-year-olds because I'm telling them how to you know, rip on someone. And they're looking at me like, we're told to be nice. Yeah, pick you know? the fuck up and say thank and, you. Uh, uh, but it was, it was pretty good. You know what? There's a video. Uh, Patrice Bergeron showed up on oh, yeah. Saturday because he's a CCM guy. Captain. And, um, and the NHL Network did a, a really cool piece on it, which I'm in. And I thought we could um, uh, take a listen and take a look at it tonight. Right on. So let's check out the CCM Hockey House. Let's do it. How cool is this? I am all geared up like I'm an NHL player and all the kids here, they'll get an opportunity as well. They're gonna be out on the ice. Maybe I'll get out there as well. One of the best parts about the CCM Hockey House, each and every year, a brand new community. All right, so CCM and Hockey House putting this together. What do you want the community to get out of this? I want the community to just feel the love from CCM. I want them to, to know that we are, um, you know, not only a force to be reckoned with, but a fun and relevant brand. Um, we're hitting our 125th year next year, but we have so much technology and so much innovation from where we came from to where we are today. And I want kids to be able to experience the brand, test out skates, test out sticks. We know that hockey is a very try it and then love it sport. It's an expensive sport. So we also want to make sure that those, those barriers to entry are kind of covered, but have fun. This is a fun event. You don't get to do something like this every single day. So um, we like to reward those towns that really love hockey and have that hockey feel and vibe. And uh, we've definitely seen the support and love from Canton and the Boston Boston area for that recently. What goes into planning this? Because I know that it takes a while. Ten, at least 10 months of planning, let's say that. Uh, I think I started with the Mosaic team back in March, starting to put together the program for this and starting to source where we're gonna put this. It's a huge logistical, um, I don't want to say nightmare, but it's a fun, fun, fun process. You have to find a house that has the ring, make sure that the family is okay with you basically taking over their house for, for five days to really activate and to, to bring this to life. And so there's a lot that goes into it um, from that perspective. But then once we got, let's say we got the keys on Sunday, we started building the rink on Sunday. Uh, everything's kind of just flown from there. And um, it took us a week to move in, but it'll take us a day to move out. <laughs> 
This house has it all. The new NHL video games, locker rooms like the pros, ping pong, goalie reaction area, and so much more. Why did you want to be a part of this and have your chirping clinic here? Well, chirping is basically comedy, and I do stand-up comedy, and I've been involved with hockey since I was three. So from playing, coaching, and refereeing, and I was quite a trash talker back in the day, so I figured, you know, kids these days, uh, it's always good to have some fun out there. And so that's why I pitched it and uh, CCM loved it. So here I am. It is a kids event, sure. And sometimes the NHL players, they're the biggest kids of them all. Patrice wanted to take the ice in the yard. Why did you want to be a part of an event like this? Well, I, first of all, you know, it's, I love the game. And CCM, I've had a, and myself, I had a great partnership over the last 20 years. And, you know, the relationship has been great. And I love the product and I think I love what they do. Uh, also, outside of hockey, you know, trying to, with the community and, and making sure that uh, uh, they grow the game and the, the awareness and and, uh, and just get people involved and talk about hockey because it's such a special sport. It's, it's a sport that uh, can give you so much uh, as a kid and growing up and the experiences and the learning things that you can get from that is, is pretty special. So I wanted to kind of come here and say hi to the kids and meet them. It's been a pretty cool experience. Boston has such a good hockey community. What has it been for you to be a part of this community for so long? Yeah, no, I've been very fortunate to, to play only for one team and to be drafted by the Bruins. You know, you, you know when you, you get drafted, you don't know where you're going to end up. And then I end up being in, uh, in a beautiful town that's not too far from my, uh, where I grew up. And, um, and yeah, the cities, you know, I kind of, right from the get-go, they welcome me with open arms. And I, I got to know that uh, uh, what kind of a community it is with people who are, uh, welcoming their, you know, uh, hard workers and and it matter, you know, their their city matters to them. You know, it's, it's important that they're proud to be Bostonians and uh, and to live with uh, with within and around New England. And um, it's a special feeling. And um, uh, I'm very glad that uh, you know my kids are born here. And it's a uh, it's a special place for all of us. Do they understand, you know, what you meant to the community, your children? I don't think they do. I, you know, in a way, sometimes when we go out and, and for dinner or, we, you know, for uh, out in the city and, you know, I get asked for a picture and autograph, maybe in a way they do get it that, you know, daddy played hockey. But, um, you know, I, I think for, for them, which is great, I'm, I'm just daddy, which is that's all I want to be for them and, and, and be there and, and support and, and uh, uh, there for, uh, uh, for anything that they really desire to do in life. What a day it was for the CCM Hockey House. I cannot wait to see where they land next year. Yeah, that was awesome. Just uh, wish you grabbed an extra sweatshirt for me. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I took it off a mannequin. And uh, I had permission, though. Um, I actually wanted to take the mannequin, too, for the hub lane, but... The CCM people from Canada didn't understand how yep. lane. Yeah, you so. can just use the line like my Uncle Aldo does. Uh, I acquired it, Your Honor. I didn't steal nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not locked down, he's taking yeah, it. I acquired it, Your Honor. <laughs> well, with that, it's a great transition to uh, welcome our guest tonight. Uh, so uh, the, the ho Hockey East, one of the premier college hockey leagues in the country, has been around for 40 years. And our, um, our guest tonight has been involved in all 40 of those years. 37 of them he spent on the ice as a referee. So we want to welcome our good friend, John Gravelis. John, welcome to the show. Ryan, thanks for having me. Little Gino, peace and love, baby. Yeah, I love you, <laughs> It's Great awesome to, to have here. you. And you brought uh, quite a spread here. Yeah, it's like a basic Italian poo poo platter. <laughs> <laughs> you got the cheese, a little Yeah, uh, that, that cheese, like it'll rip your felons out and it'll put hair on places that you didn't know had. <laughs> <laughs> no, you had. I love it. I'm Irish, so I'm afraid of cheese. I'll be well, honest with you. Try the soposada. I, you know what? Anything I, that has that many vowels in it, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to trust it. Well, but we, those we'll, cannolis, I'm definitely taking one of them down. Yeah, you can take two. This is you. You. I mean, well, what other guest brings a whole spread like this? None. I don't know. And then we, you know, there's some. Uh, Liquid refreshment. Yeah, you got if you if uh, you got if, you, if you're into a little bit, why not? Thanks, Brad. You're welcome. Yeah, that, that's Riles, you're amazing. not gonna have something. Hey, that was a hell of an apple right there. <laughs> that was a hell of an apple. Um, Seasoned actually, bartender. I would love to grab, but I'm uh, I'm actually 18 years off the off the sauce. I'm sorry, I didn't know no, that. No, 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 no. It's quite alright. If I'd right. known that, I would have brought high C. <laughs> 
Kool Aid? <laughs> we could have the Kool Aid. I'll tell you what. If I'm gonna drop off, if I'm gonna, if I'm get, you know, if the wagon's coming off, right? If I'm jumping off the wagon, uh, uh, no offense, but it ain't gonna be here in a studio with you two. All right. <laughs> so be, where are we going? It's gonna be in Vegas with <laughs> hooking strippers and midgets. That's I got a couple of C notes in my pocket. Right now. That We're the nice show. The golden bananas up here. <laughs> well, I got. I can get them all changed into one dollar bills. <laughs> Stick them to our heads and I'm walk in the door. I just throw Canadian coins at them. That's what I do. The toonies and loonies. Oh, that's fun. I love going to the strip club in Montreal, especially when you're like 18, 19. You know, you could drink up there. Awesome. <laughs> Those are our spring breaks. Well, before this turns into a different kind of podcast, <laughs> which it could quickly uh, turn into. This might fall uh, off the rails a bit. No, yeah, no, no. All quite all right. Uh, Grav, why don't we start by um, finding out, how did you get into refereeing? Um, well, first, I got to say thanks for having me here. This is this is great. It gets me out of the house. <laughs> Deb and I took the dogs for a little walk and uh, told her I was hitting the road. I said, where, she, where are you going? I said, I'm going to do a podcast. because you don't even know what a fucking podcast is. <laughs> I said, no, Riles and little Gino are setting it. We're going to fucking have a night. That's so awesome. She wanted to know what channel, and I said, I don't, I, I, <laughs> homie, don't play that game. Back channel. <laughs> but thanks for having me. No, this is great. We'll, so. we'll let you know where to find it. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll send a carrier pigeon to you. <laughs> tell yeah, you give no, you directions. I'm, I'm good with an abacus, not a calculator. <laughs> Um, no, fire away, you guys. So how did you get into reffing? How, like, um, so, like, I left school. School wasn't for me. And then I uh, came home, started working. And in Wakefield, there used to be a, a learn-to-skate kind of clinic thing yeah. up at Hockey Town. Um, so Billy Ryder, the guy from Wakefield, he ran this program. And he asked me if I'd help out. So I just used to go there on Sundays, help out with the little kids. And then at the end of the session, like the last 20 minutes, they'd have a, like a little scribbage. So he asked me to just go up and down with the kids. So that worked out for a while. And then um, my father's best friend growing up in you know, East Boston and shit, Joe Ferraro, he ran and managed the old Wilmington Youth Hockey Leagues. Oh, yeah. This is long before all youth hockey took off I think now. this is before Gino was born. Yeah, oh, yeah, this is like 70s, early 70s when Joe started that thing up in the old Wilmington rinks. I was just uh, there last weekend, brought back a lot of memories. Where? Wilmington. Not that rink. This no, rink this is now one? like, oh, this is like a DeMoula's warehouse now. <laughs> it ain't no rink no more. But back then, Joe used to run that loop. And my dad used to be the timekeeper. Oh, yeah. used to call him Father Time. <laughs> so we'd take a ride up, stop at the donut shop, go up to the rink, and I'd kind of hang out with him. And after a while, it worked out that, you know, would you want to do this? Joe asked me if I'd be in. I said, fuck, no, I, I want a referee. And so I started helping doing the clock. And then after doing the clock, I said, this sucks. I'm sitting here freezing my ass off. I'd rather be out there fucking skating. So... I started doing youth hockey, and I got into doing youth hockey, early 20s, and then the little kids started getting a little bigger because mm -hmm. you started you know, doing all right as a ref. And then uh, I started liking it, and you know, it just fell into place. As you progress as an official, the games get better, you develop, and then uh, you, know, you just keep taking the steps um, more or less, you know, not too, too much too fast, not mm -hmm. too much too soon. And then the people you meet I was help you get the, the people you meet. I'll tell you the relationships are huge. Yeah, the, the guys that help you out from the beginning to the end, they're your best friends for life. Oh yeah. And uh, as long as some of them are still still with us, I can say that. And the ones that have passed on, you know, God bless them. Yeah. I'll tell you, for me, I got two sitting right in front of me. Right, like you two were that for me growing up. Right, like watching watching you guys ref. Watch like saw you all all the time on TV. Like you were. A, Mentor of mine, you know. Well, I used to come to your house. Oh, know, yeah. Diapers running around. <laughs> yeah. Me, oh, yeah. Your, me and your father had been gone for like two days. Then we'd show up. <laughs> that's my dad. Hey, that's, we can tell that story. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's my good. dad. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're oh. going to have him on eventually. Yeah. But, um, how, so Hockey East is like, how did you end up there, though? All right. Because like, so. the track is different. Like, my track was different than Geno's, which is different uh -huh. than the kids now um, and where we ended up. So how did like how did Hockey East happen? So Riles, the track has changed dramatically. Yeah. So the time. old days, you started it, and back then it was called A House, mm. right? It wasn't even USA Hockey. I don't think they knew what a, nobody had that marker yet. It was always A House. From there, I you know started doing the little kids, 
and then uh, started getting up to Pee Wee Midget after a couple years, let's say three years at the youth level. Um, at that time, I remember Hockey Town was one of the rinks that mm -hmm. Joe used, and that's when I met Jimmy Doyle. Oh, yeah, Uncle Jim. And oh, yeah. Jimmy, you know, hey, kid, you got to fucking get off the fucking stick here. You got to step it up. We can get you in high school hockey. And ironically, Jimmy was a big, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what he means to what how I developed because he put me in the right place. Two doors down from my house in Wakefield, Jimmy Quinn lived there. And Jimmy said the same thing. When you're going to get, you should get into high school. So the year before I got into high school hockey, or no, that year, Ironically, I was selected to go to a camp out in Colorado Springs. It was like the old uh, sports festival kind of deal. Okay. East, west, yeah. north. But anyway, I was selected with a bunch of guys from this way. And ironically, Brian Murphy was one of the participants in this camp. Mark Rudolph ran it. Oh, yeah. uh, A.J. Foyt, Brian Hart, Pat DePuzo. Oh, wow. So you got training on the ice in the classroom. You went out and did some games. Ron's the best. And then at that time... I was just started. I did get into East Mass chapter, high school hockey, and it all started <clears throat> snowballing from there. So the first year in the chapter, you know, you get some games. You, it, it's, you know, who you know, yeah. you know, and very rarely did a first-year guy get anything, really, other than JV games. Well, but, my, yeah, that, my first year of high school, I had to do JV games. And I only did two varsity that uh, Marty McDonough gave me. Oh, Marty. And I said to Marty, I go, I can't do varsity. And he's like, I'm the commissioner. I'm You'll the do commissioner. what I tell you. <laughs> and, uh, but it's funny because that's what it was. And then I went to do juniors and pro the next year from JV. Well, so. that's where what we talked about, the people you meet, your contacts. Yeah. You know, the communication between everybody. So that first year, I was doing more JVs. I didn't get a varsity game. But then... Freddie Carpenito. Oh, Tom, yeah. Mr. Carpenito. Yep. Old man. The old man. Yep. Mr. Carpenito. Yeah. He assigned me to a game, and it was at Tully Forum. It was Matuin against somebody. I don't know who they played. I remember Matuin was one of the – but DeCap was my partner. Wow. Wow. Now, DeCap, you know, I knew he was an Arlington guy. Um, DeCap was – the first varsity game I did was with DeCap, and I didn't know DeCap from, from anybody, and he – Knew I was a first year guy and he helped me along. Mm -hmm. Now that relationship grew. I don't have to, we won't get into that now, but over the years, he's been unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Like one yeah. of the best guys in hockey. Oh, like yeah. The cap, yeah. cap kind of helped you along and, and, you know, got you to where you got to be. And so after all that first game stuff, you know, just like now, but not as bad, commissioners need guys. You never say no. You go anywhere. That yeah, bag will so travel. The phone yep. rings and you're going anywhere. So what happened is over time, I got a game at Graton School. Chip McDonald was playing in the game. Chippa. And wait a minute, Gra Graton, Graton, Graton. Graton School. The is Graton, it? Graton School. <laughs> that's how he. That's how he. So what text. happened <laughs> is I was there to do the JV game. So I did the JV game with Colin McDonald, God rest his soul, another all-star. Oh, yeah. As far as officials go. But Colin and I did the game together. We did the JV game. So now, right after is the varsity game. And sure as shit, what happens, one official shows up, me. I'm the guy because nobody showed up to do the game. You got to stay and do the varsity. Colin had to go do another game. So I stayed. Now, I'm a new guy in the chapter. All right, I'll I can handle this, I get. I hope. So, before the game, an older gentleman comes in the room. How you doing, my boy? Here's a coffee. Here's a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> this, this sounds like a, All right. it's going in a bad place. So, <laughs> and George, what's your name? Johnny Gravel, he's nice to meet you. I'm Mr. Stewart. Bill Stewart, number two. All right, not the third. The father. Yeah, yeah. Mr. yeah. Stewart. Oh, wow. I knew him when I grew I up in know. East wow, Boston. I awesome. knew he was a legend. Oh, right? yes. yeah. So I knew him as a kid. And we had Paul on the last episode, so. So this is his dad. Yeah. And Billy's dad. So what happens? First period. It's a fucking war. I think it was Brooks against Graton. It was fucking crazy. <laughs> I called him up. I, got, I had fucking guns loaded. I had a re-fucking more ammo. 
I think I had probably, you know, a bunch of penalties. For, I come in after the first period, shaking my head. He comes in again with a hot cocoa and a cookie. My boy, just keep doing what you're doing. Love it. Love, wow. Just keep taking them. Just keep taking And he'd leave. Second piss, same thing. So I'd go out, did that game. It, You know, first year kid, I was like, holy shit, this is fucking crazy. Mr. Stewart came in at the end of the game, and he just said, I did a great job. Thank you. And, uh, you know, what's my history, where I've been. And I told him about the camp, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, I did get a couple more varsity games, mostly JVs. Hmm. At the end of the year, I got a call from Mr. Stewart to do a state tournament game. That's awesome. Like, really? Wow. That was like unhurt. So I was at Loring Arena, born against Medway with Jason McAteer. Wow. Now, if you guys know Jason... Absolutely fucking bonkers. Oh, yeah. From Pluto. And, <laughs> and, and talk about having fun. Jason had a great time. He was a great official to work with. Um, and we went out and did that game, and there was more shit going on, and we just kept calling him. Yeah, keep running And them. Uh, that was my first year in the chapter. I had fun. It was great. Um, and after that, it just blossomed. But what happens is... At that time, I was single, out of my fucking mind and crazy. Had a blast refereeing hockey. I loved it. So I got the bug, and then what happens is Marty McDonough, Jimmy Doyle, um, Billy Stewart, mm -hmm. Ned Bunyan, they all had games. 365 days a year, 24-7. Yep. I'd go through two pairs of skates a year, and you'd go to Europa Cup. Europa Hockey Cup. night in Boston. Cup. College night development. In Boston. Your father and I used to go to Europa Cup. Yeah. We'd do the first two Dennis games. Scholes, yeah. Right? I think the first two games was 7 and like 8.30. Yeah. We'd do the first two games, go to the pool. Oh, yeah. Hang out Bab by the pool at Babo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, 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 <laughs> hang out at the pool. <laughs> right? And then go back in and do two more. Yeah. And, but that's, that's so good. And then on Saturday nights, you'd go down to Hingham. College Development League. Yep. You do two games. There was a five twenty, a seven thirty, and a nine forty. And Night Train was on the clock. Oh, you got and in and Night Train. Night. He had it down on the science, but you got a fifty minute Mr. game in Mr. 45. Lehman and Mr. Massiel. Oh, Lehman, yeah. Were always there, and they gave you a check on the spot. Yeah. And so all fall, all summer, so all year you were reffing. Like I said, I was single and out of my marbles and having an absolute blast doing it. So before you go on, we got to explain who Night Train is. Um, yes. Night Train was a, was a guy who ran the clock in Hingham, and he could chop time off a <laughs> clock better than anyone in the world. And he always You'd, had a dog with him. He had that always little had a dog, dog with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and like you'd, there'd be 15 minutes to go in a period, and you'd look, and there was eight minutes. Like he was, he was a, he was like a, a wizard. Fifty minute was game at forty five. Yeah, the awesome. clock was on that wall. When the puck went down the other end, yep. All of a sudden, you'd look back and come. You looking skating up yeah. the other end? Yeah. Where'd that last? The five minutes? Huh? Five minutes? Yeah. Just a now, nine. A nine now, can turn into a five. There's a never five. just so the hockey parents out there that are dropping thirteen grand on on you know hockey and stuff. This never happens now. No. All right, you no. get your full you do yeah, forty five minutes yeah. or whatever. Um, cause you know, but it was anyway. all, it never happened during regular season. <laughs> no, it was always summer, was, it was summer, 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 summer spring. Yeah, yeah. Summertime. But not real games, but, no. but hey, I had to explain. No, the that's the night a train. might be listening going, what is a night train? <laughs> <laughs> but the best part about going down there was you made, I think they gave you like almost a C note a game. It was always cash too, it was right? a check. Oh, check. A okay. check. It was always in a hand. check. In hand. In hand, yeah. So the way I saw it was. If you went down there and did that, and let's say you made 200 bucks, right? Yep. I netted 400 bucks because I saved myself 200 bucks from going, from going out. Yeah, right. And hanging out with right. all the, yeah. the nitwits, right? Yeah, yeah. So on the way home, <clears throat> always dovetail right into the ocean kai. Yes, you, you guys always went up there. And we sat the check on the bar, the check had cashed. And we sat there. That that doesn't happen anymore. Like guys, well, you me, can't. The like, fucking ocean guy is gone. Well, no, it's a fucking, it's a fucking, <laughs> yeah, fucking pretty, apartment building. I'm pretty sure you can't go into a restaurant now <laughs> and cash a check either. No, oh, that's true too. Yeah, I, mean, that, <laughs> I used to be able to do that. Yeah, the the, pro yeah, the proprietor was a hockey guy. Oh yeah, and, uh, he had a, you know he had a 
Great Chinese food, French fries and brown gravy, Marty McDonough's special. Yeah, that's right. But Man, I, that was a you great know, place. The ah. guy like the guys that assign those summer tournaments, mm. like I said, Marty, Billy Stewart, the um the old Pro Am. Oh yeah. That Pro played Am down in down in uh, Quincy. Yeah. Cool. Um, that, was that Joe Lyons? No, who ran that? The O'Connells? O'Connells. O'Connells ran, O'Connell's ran O'Connell's, the Pro-Am, right? Yeah. And then and Pro-Leet Joe Lyons. Pro-Leet, Pro-Leet was, was Joe Lyons. Yeah. And, and then that Jimmy. Quincy that comes to mind. Jimmy yep. had Hockey Night in Boston at yep. Stoneham Arena. Yes. And I'll tell you, the things that came out of those, those <laughs> leagues were great. Oh, yeah. But yeah. all the shit that you learn as a referee happened. In those. In right. those games. Because it was, you know, looser atmosphere. All right, summer rules are in effect. No fucking icing. Play on. Just <laughs> no, keep going. Yeah. No ice outside. No, no ice, ice inside. inside. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Only well, ice is in my drink. Thing. So <laughs> we that was how back then you developed through your chapter, through the summer leagues, through all your contacts. If you were hungry and willing to take that fucking bag and carry it, not fucking wheel it <laughs> like a little fucking airline stewardess. <laughs> Yeah, don't um, like the wheel no, bags. No, no wheelie bags. No wheelie grab. bags are grab. <laughs> no, no, you carry your bag, but that's how you developed. And what happens is all those people that, you know, observed you or watched you or mm-hmm. worked with you, you know, like I said, those guys like Jimmy, Marty, Billy Stewart, uh, Ned, the people that assigned those games during the off season are what basically helped you move forward. Yeah. Because – there's no pressure in those games. There's you're a out. lot of value in what you're saying right now. Like there's there's oh, a yeah. ton of value in what you're saying, and, and I don't think these kids get it. It's all, I always I always say like, you know, invest in your craft, right? Like always work yeah. in your craft, and that's in the summertime is the best time to do it, right? Like absolutely. It, like I used to do like five on five off in the summertime, right? It's like two man system. I yeah. I would referee. I would go up and down the ice for five minutes. The linesman and someone would just drop the puck, and you you're getting reps in, and you're not just yeah. sitting there freezing your ass off. You know, you're actually getting something out of a summer spring league. Yep. And, and, like, now there's a million camps. Murph runs the Hobb camp, right? Like, we, we run a couple of camps. We got all these tournaments that you're talking about now. Yep. And that it's a great place to, to develop. So, like. So, Gino, getting back to how you move forward. Yeah. Now, now compared to back then. So, through mm-hmm. your chapter, you would be nominated to work ECAC. Yep. Hockey. Oh, that's right. Yeah, right? that's yeah, hockey. Yeah, awesome. That's the process. That's so, right. Because yeah. they were all insured. Right? That's right. Yeah. So basically, your name got submitted through your chapter that's right. to the Cape. Mm. All right. Where Hutch, Dick Ma, uh, Ian Glover, everything was run out of the yeah. Cape. So your name got submitted, you were nominated, and you either got selected to go or not for, for ECAC basically starting out in Division Tree. So that they ran everything back then. What yeah. happened is, before all that, before I was nominated and selected, I, I had given two years to high school hockey, and I was approached uh, when hockey East started in '84. I was asked by Dana Henniger to be a goal judge. Dana was close because, you know, he had an ear to high school hockey. Dartmouth guy. Um, Mel, originally a Melrose guy, but he lived in Reading, and we had some common friends. And he, you know, he called and asked if I'd be interested in goal judging. So yeah, I can't. Why wouldn't I? You're an illuminator. I want to go check it out. Yeah, <laughs> Renaissance guy. <laughs> so I show up, and you know, I watch guys like McBride, Folksy, um, Bushy I was Quinn, yeah. DeCap. And you watch these guys perform at the highest level around here. Yep. Now, the only junior level was the old Springfield picks. Right. And that was, you know, that was, it wasn't, wasn't even, junior no, like it is now. No, no, it wasn't. Nothing either. compared. Just so me. to learn yeah. and develop at the junior level to get way to, to college hockey wasn't really a, a thing. Uh, yeah. No. So you either developed through your chapter, through the summer leagues, and then, like I said, you got nominated. But Dana, Hockey East, when hockey's formed, don't forget, all those teams, they seceded. They pulled away from the old ECAC. Right. And all the officials that went were kind of blackballed by the ECAC because, hey, who the fuck are those guys? They're all of a sudden better than us. They oh, picked them right. to go to Hockey East. And yeah, because they were everything was part of ECAC. Everything was all ECAC. Well, no, it's in my backyard. That's why I chose. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? 
So you you basically have this Super League formed. So, like I said, I got in the first year as a goal judge. I watched these guys. I had an absolute fucking blast doing it. It really opened your eyes to what the highest level in the area was. Mm. Um, and then after that first year as a goal judge, Dana asked if I'd be interested. You know, he'd like to use me as a linesman based on my performance at the high school level. Right. Because he's close. Back then, Charlie Holden assigned yeah. the Middlesex League. Yep. To cap assigned the Catholic Conference. So, and Charlie was the head of officials, like, um, for the NCAA. Right. Like Frank is now. Right. So, what happens right. is all that communication between those guys helped me get, but the guys that started me out, like Marty, Jimmy, those that got Billy, they pushed you through. So, once Hockey East took off for me, Dana, I got into ECAC probably a year after I was a linesman at the Hockey East level. So Dana would, he would coach me. Dana, I got to tell you, he plucked me out of the gutter and just said, here's what you need to do. And he, Dana was a great teacher. Mm. Um, I respected him. He used to say, Grav, be careful what you do after the game. <laughs> There's eyes everywhere. That's and good advice. He would yeah. tell you things that just made sense. Right. Then he'd say to me, he'd say, Grav, you can't be misquoted if you don't say anything. And <laughs> that's, that's, I'd that's listen to him, and, and you know what? And his, he just wanted to see you succeed. Right. But he gave you enough rope that if you're going to hang yourself, here it fucking comes. Right. But I always listened to Dana, and as I developed at, as a linesman, ECAC, I got selected to go there. So then he told me, look, Grav, any chance you get to referee in Division Three, ECAC, go take those games. Yes. Don't, I don't, linesmen, I, I, I can use other people, but I want you to develop as a ref. I agree with that. So your experience at the high school level, at the ECAC Division Three level, is basically how you develop to get to be a Division One ref. As, and we won't get into how it is now. No. Oh. But back then, that's how it worked. Yeah. So Division Three, Babson, Sail, Seldom Straight, um, <laughs> all, all, all these schools, like, otherwise known as Salem, Salem State, State right? Salem Straight. But you went and did those games, and it's compared comparing it to high school. It's like going to do the JV games where all bets are off, shit can happen, fucking yeah. crazy shit. At the Division Three level, that's what you learn, though. That's like that's like learn. that's how you learn how to manage a game. Like, cause you'll see stuff there that you'll yep. never see in a Division One game, right. or you know, and you got to yep. work through it. And back then, you you were probably by yourself or two and one. Um, back then in ECAC, two and two, two man, two, two man, two man, right? Yeah, that's they, how you started with two man system. When right? I played at Curry, they still had two man. Paul Crump yeah, did they a bunch had fucking of fucking wooden games. pucks when you played it. Someone <laughs> asked. Someone asked me what wooden the low sticks. Level, that's wooden sure. sticks. Someone asked me the uh, the lower level juniors. Why don't they just go back to the two man? Because sometimes those referees in the lower levels are struggling big time. Oh yeah. And they're like, "How is this major penalty not getting called?" And I'm right. like, "They're like, why don't we just do two? Everybody can call everything." But well, in, ahead, in yeah. the two man, you know, back then in the ECAC, you had everything going on the lines and. Yep. I've seen everything. You probably had like a two, two line pass, too, all of it, right? No, no, there was never a two line. College hockey never, never had Never had, never had the two line. Pro. Yeah. That was only pro. Um, but what would happen is you'd get your experience refereeing at the Division three level. So over time, Dana then worked me in as a part time ref in Hockey East and then a part time line. So I was kind of in the limbo between the two. But I would complement it with games in the ECAC. Now ECAC makes me a Division One ref. ECAC, I'm doing div so now I'm doing fucking you know worldwide fucking college hockey. This is great. So and this is D one was one and two, right? Back one then D one was always one two. One back two, then. yeah. So yep. what ended up Thanks happening is <laughs> <laughs> salute, Papa. Hey, thank you, my friend. Salute. Hey, nobody else fucking brings shit like this, right? <laughs> no. Tell you, poo-poo platter. <laughs> you, I'll bring you, you boiled dinner. Impressive. I'll bring you boiled dinner boiled next dinner time. Boiled dinner my ass. Salt was a spice when I was growing up. Come on. I like this TB stuff. TB and right J. TB and J on, on, <laughs> on Wonder Bread. 
Not even Italian bread for Christ's sake. You are ripping half of <laughs> No, who was in? Who was not? To get in I love you. I really have some fucking no cheese. No one's better. Um, go see a dentist tomorrow what? when you rip out half. My your brother's fillings. my dentist. He don't like me because I I'm don't. Get pay Hopper. Him. Um, actually, my nephew now, who, and they're also the Bruins dentist. My brother uh, Teddy and my nephew Eddie. Uh, both the Bruins. Your brother's Teddy. Yeah, Teddy. Like that little fucking. Ted was, <laughs> no, no, not Ted. <laughs> that little, that little bear. <laughs> not the bear. No, well, he's as crazy. Jumped as from the bear. Fenway Wall. But, yeah, no, the, the all the stuffing the, came out. <laughs> <laughs> I almost got a part in the TV show. I almost was the dump truck. Oh, that would have been awesome. That. Yeah, but I digressed. Um, who? What? What teams were in the AC, ECAC D one back then? Oh, well, great question. Yeah, Harvard. Local was Harvard, Yale, Brown, um, Dartmouth. Harvard, Yale, Brown, Dartmouth. Um, those New York schools. Yep. Clarkson, Colgate, Cornell. Cornell. St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence. Lawrence. So I was nonstop. Yeah. I was fucking everywhere, every weekend. So I remember there was a time when both leagues were saying, enough's enough. We've got guys that we want on our side. Instead of them being on your side on Friday or Saturday night, we want mm-hmm. we're missing those guys because they're off doing your league. And both leagues went back and forth. So I was told that I had to make a choice. And Dana, in fairness to him, he gave me my start. He helped me get to where I was. He had faith in me. And I told the ECAC, I'm done. I said, I'm going to, my allegiance is to Hockey East. And since then, I've been here ever since. And wow. it's been a, it's unbelievable, you know, what the fun that you have, the room with the guys on the ice, with the players, the coaches, administrators, the rink personnel. And you're still involved in Hockey East now. So tell everybody yeah. what you do now. As a, no, now. As um, a, what do you, what do they call the teacher or a, um, a coach? I am, yes. Uh, my official title yeah. is men's ice hockey officiating coach. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, because you were there the yeah, first you year. My, I you, did, you coached me up. The first year I did it. Grav, I still got the three messages on my phone for the last three games I worked. And they were. The best messages I could have ever receive. But. So that would have been the Hockey East final. That would have been the NCAA first round game, and then the NCAA final. Um, you missed one. What's 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 in my uh, what's in the first two weeks of February? Oh, the bean pot. Yeah, I forgot it. Yeah. That was that. Honestly, that was the best one of them all. To be honest with you, <laughs> that one, that so, one, that one meant the most <laughs> to me because of my grandfather, right in Boston and. So, and you get the final. Like, come on. That's unbelievable. Do like, you remember the night before? No, the night of the first very, very first bean pot that I worked. Mm. I came and yeah. met your father. Yeah, you picked him up. I wanted to go. I was pissed. And you were in the living room. Yeah. <laughs> and I told you I'd, I'd yeah. say hello to you. Oh, yeah. You oh, said hello to me on TV. When I dropped the puck. It was awesome. So, oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I want to go. You had, I remember my mom I was like him. 7, 8 years old. My mom's like, you can't call. You got school, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, listen, kid, just watch the open and drop. I'll say hello to you. I said, I'm going to adjust a piece of my equipment. Well, you, had an, you had a very unique way of saying hello to people. Yeah. Yes. I just opening drop. I adjust my cup. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure, you know, things are where they're supposed yeah. to be. Hello, everybody. And then I dropped the puck. Mm-hmm. I told little Gino I'd do that. Huh. So we get to the rink. Big Gene didn't have a ticket. Well, how about I carry a bag? Oh, yeah, I'll carry a bag in. His dad carried my bag. No. Yeah. No. Carried my bag in. I walked in. I had my, my little tag that said that I'm official. Yeah. And he walked in. I mean, we had a great night. That That's was awesome. But for little Gino to do all three of those oh, events, amazing. that for me, after watching him in diapers right. and then doing what he's doing yeah. back then, what? Two two and a half years ago, yep, right to what he's doing now. It's called giving back. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, and having fun doing something you love to do. Right. I mean, do I miss being on the ice? Absolutely, but I didn't want to be plucked. I didn't want to be told. I wanted to go out on my terms. So you know, my wife and my kids would ask, "Hey, Dad, what the fuck? You know, you've been there forever." My wife would say, "John, how much longer are you going to do this? I know what it takes to get ready." Mm. So. June, 
between June and October, I'd have to get on a fucking eucalyptical machine. <laughs> I'd have to eat right. I'd have to fucking at least, you know, show some semblance of being in shape, skate yeah. a couple of times, you know, be on the ice, and then show up and work a full season. And then uh, I thought about it, and I remember I told Deb, you know, Deb, we want to walk to the beach with you. We don't want to wheel you down in a fucking buggy. So I said, all right, I circled the date on the calendar, July 22nd. I don't know why. I just mm. picked that date. And uh, on that day, I'm going to make my decision. And then I called Murph. I called uh, Brian, and I just told him I'd like to talk. Maybe we can get together and shoot the shit about the season coming up. Mm. And, uh, of course, Brian wanted to make sure everything was okay. Um, and I told him, yeah, everything's good, Murph. I just, just want to make sure we're all set for the season coming up. And uh, Deb had asked me when the time came, are you, are you really going to do this? I said, yeah, I'm ready. I'm done. I'm, I, I can do this. So uh, we met. Commissioner Metcalf asked permission to join us for a little Italian poo-poo platter. Nice. Right? Over right. in Wakefield, over a nice bowl of pasta vasul soup and some bread and some nice Italian feed bag. And I told him I'm ready. And... Uh, you know, do you want to do a last game? Do you want to do this? No, I did my last game. Um, that was UMass and Maine in a uh, tournament playoff game. And uh, um, Red Gendron, it was his last game. And Red, Red held a special play. I mean, Red, going back to Hockey Night in Boston at Stoneham, yeah. he was coaching at Vermont, Bellows Free Academy at the time. He'd come down, stay at the hotel down the street off of Montvale Ave, and he'd come out with us after the games. We'd go to the ground round. I mean, we closed the fucking place. Uh, every peanut shell was fucking gone. We were, we were done. But Red, he had a special play, and, you know, God rest his soul, what happened to him. You know, I, I just, I wanted to take time for me. I wanted to enjoy myself. I didn't want, God forbid, something. But anyway, I did the right thing. I came off. Murph and Steve offered me a shot at doing what I'm doing now. And, uh, it's been great. You guys got a good thing cooking over there. Yeah. Good well, team. I mean, Gio, you know, lived great. it. Like, you, yeah, I loved it. I, I love working for you guys. It was awesome. It's like, a total. You see the game so much differently. Yeah. Uh, on the ice. And then when you're sitting upstairs. Big time. The the reviews, the the little things that, that go on, it, it, it's magnified a hundred times. Mm -hmm. um, the pressure that's on you guys, the coaches to win, the players to to develop and move on to the next level. Yeah. Um, the game's changed so much. Now, especially time. now where we've talked about it before, the video and the replay. What's your, what's your oh, take on that? The replay nuts. and uh, the video. I'm old and school. Riles. I, like, Riles. Back we, in the day, all right? It was one referee, two linesmen. Make a decision. The guys, the goal mm -hmm. judges, and that's it. Yep. And, you know, I like to think we got it right. Yeah, well, all, all the time on the wash, right? You you, you, you can't miss something one end, but you miss it at the other, and it all washed out. It, you know what? This video shit is taking on a new life of its own. Challenges, red flags, fucking you know. You just pick, a, let the game play out. Like I, I just had a conversation with a D one coach this week over over reviews. We had two missed major penalties, and he chose not to challenge him. And I go, why didn't you challenge him? And he doesn't. You know, they don't have, they're probably one of the only Division One schools that don't really have like a solid guy up in the booth looking yeah. at it, right? And, and he goes, well, why should I be officiating from the bench? I go, well, the officials didn't have it on the ice, right? And, he, and I go, well, they're not going to go run in and look at every single play. I go, they judged it once and they viewed it as such, right? So they don't have a major on the play, right? Okay. Yeah. If, challenge it then. It's a free, t it's a, basically a free one. You get a timeout and... You know, you might even win it, right? And then you get your time out back and off you go. And that's if the referees and nobody has a major penalty on the ice, right? Yep. We're, we're forcing them to challenge. I think it's going to end up going that way where the coaches have to challenge to get you in the booth anyway. Because if not, we're just going to be running into the booth, looking at every little Everything. thing, and, and nine out of ten times, it's nothing, right? No, guys so like, rely on it too much. Yeah, no. guys rely on it. I, I'm a firm believer in real time. When yeah. you see a major penalty and you know a guy gets bum-blasted bad, yeah. Or hitting the head bad, you know it. Everything, like it sticks up, everything, man. just goes oh. Yeah. And the, the arm goes, goes up, right up, and instinctively you know that's a major. Yep. And 
you know, that just comes with experience, right. more or less. Um, using the video, whether it be a goal scoring situation or a major penalty, can't it's become a crutch. And that's and that's and, what it and, creates too, right? And that's what I said said to the coach. I go, listen, I go, if if not, I go, it's human nature that the referees will oh I, I can go look at that. I don't have to put my arm up yeah. right now. So then I'll just go look at it and then I'll be fine yeah. and then boom boom. So like I'm putting the pressure on or we're putting the pressure on um the referees to get it right live. So like when I wear talk east, that was the policy, right? Yeah. It was awesome because if I didn't feel as such, I was like, I'd ask the linesman every once in a while. The linesman would go, hey, I got a potential major. And I'm like, okay, I'll go look at it. Right. Yeah. And then you come out, it's not. Or if it is, oh, hey, great catch. But right? what Gino says is key. Riles, you've got eight eyeballs. Right. On the fucking eye. One of those eight eyeballs has to see that. Better see right. it. Um, and then getting into the video stuff, the teams, whoever's up in the booth as their video coordinator. Right has to know something about the game hmm. and they got to understand what it means to lose a time out in a certain situation to challenge pay attention to the videos are sent out every week and stuff like that you know and watch yeah. and, and and like pay attention to the criteria and the and all like the points of emphasis right like the arm extension like that the spin off like you were saying on monday night like all those indicators like yeah. you see the guy spin he stays down but if he like gets right up and gets going you know he probably Probably clean hit, yeah, right? yeah, because yeah. so, yeah, hockey players don't go down unless right. they're hurt. Right, and exactly. They don't go down. They don't get hurt unless they get hit illegally, you know. And, and that's what I always say. And you always look at, you know, look at the evidence of what happened. I only I did one game with video. Um, I did that game. I did for your dad. Um, what was it? Army at AIC during COVID. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Fifteen years in between. My last D1 college game and that one, right? Luke Galvin's called me Hockey Jesus. I rose from the dead, right? And uh, he actually got HockeyJesus.com. He yeah, he it does it. Yeah, just yeah. in case. It's great. And, but that was the only game I ever did with video, and I didn't even think of it. And one of the a goal was scored, and, you know, it, I was the high guy. And I go, and I'm doing the line change, and my line just says, oh, he's looking at it, my partner. And I went, what's he looking at? And he, I don't know, he's looking at it. So I go in the booth and I go, what, what are you doing? And he goes, uh, I just want to make sure it didn't go off his skate. I go, it didn't. And he goes, well, I just want to make sure. I go, I just fucking made sure for you. <laughs> I go, why didn't you ask me before you went to the, I, I could have told you, it went right off his stick because it was, the kid was on the other, you know, my side of the net. Yeah. And he goes, well, I just, I just, you know, want to make sure. I go, well, I could have made sure for you if you just asked me. And now we're in here. No one, no one knows what's going on. And we both look like idiots because, why are we in here? Why you have you a hug. And That's of right. course, have a hug right before in. you go in. And of yeah. course, right? He, he goes. I go. Oh, look at that! It went off his fucking stick. I could have told you that five minutes ago. <laughs> and off we went. And uh, it was a little awkward for five or ten minutes. And and then we were a lot fine of friction. Again. There's a lot of friction in uh, hockey. Yeah, oh, yeah, a lot of friction. Yeah, Paul. Well, a, lot a lot of, of egos. Ego. A lot but of that, egos too. But that that's what like. That's why I was like, why are we doing this? It, there's two of us out now. There's four. Right. What's your favorite system? Do you like that? Because you got the two man, you got the one and two, you got the two and one, and you got the, the four. Two man. And one is no, two and one is two and one. Two and one. By the that. way, because Horrible. because the line the referee. I hate two and one. I hate two and one. The ref the the front referee going in has to watch the line. Stupid. And then you got to watch for infractions and get to the net. No. 2-1 sucks. Yep. I, I missed a major Agreed. penalty um, in the junior game. Remember, uh, the juniors had 2-1, and one, like, way back when. Like, I was working pro hockey then, right? So I come back, and I'm, like, I'm like on the blue line. I'm making it off sides, and then, boom, kid gets laid out. And I'm, like, what the heck just happened? Yeah. And I'm, like, why am I calling off sides? And I'm, yeah. like, what is going on? And then the 1-2, unless your last name is fucking Jetson and you got a fucking jetpack, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> You, <laughs> but we did it all those years. I know we did, but we did Riles, all those years. the game is so you it's, can't do it it's now. Too fast. It's too fast. These now. kids are fucking specimens. Yeah, they have they have like after the game they don't they don't go out and and chase women. Junior and, hockey, you and, can and do drink it. Drink pizza and drink beers. They yeah. got to get on a bike, drink a, a some kind of frap thing. <laughs> <laughs> like homie, no protein frap. Yeah, they got to drink some fucking. <laughs> Crazy concoction, and then go work out and go for a swim in some Take pool. Take a nice bath. Some pool that don't, you can't go nowhere. You just stay still and swim. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is the game is so fast. Yeah. And for one guy to go up and down, it, 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 it's it's too it's too much. Yeah. So the 2-2, two, two, with 
Gino said earlier in those situations where video is in play, those four guys get together and huddle. Communication between the group, the team. It's not about one guy. It's mm-hmm. about all four and guys. And it's also, it's also about asking the right questions, too. Like, if you're the yeah. referee, like, you've got to ask the right questions and get the answer you want. Like, like most referees, and especially the Division One level, they have a lot of experience. Some might have yeah. some pro experience. And, you know, they've been in situations in the one-man system where they had to ask a yeah. goal judge. A, like a, a oh, I've been there, done Right? That. And, oh, like, yeah. my favorite thing with goal judges is ask them, hey, whatever you do, don't shake your head yes or no. Okay. And then the, yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's like, head. hey, I right. fucking chucked one from a game. <laughs> oh, no kidding. You threw out a goal judge. That's right. You threw out a goal judge. Man, Providence. Fucking guy. It was, I was on the goal line watching the play. Puck never crossed the line. Goalie tied it up. And I look, and the goal just put the light on. I look at him and I go, fuck. <laughs> and he's going like this. And I go, he goes, I go. <laughs> and he was fucking adamant. So I went over to the glass. Right? <laughs> Dusted it off. And I said, hey, asshole. That's right. <laughs> there was no fun. And then he got fucking belligerent. And I had him thrown from the building. We emailed him. They had a oh, replacement guy going to finish the game. <laughs> but yeah. That, Find another that eliminator. <laughs> Listen, for those people who don't understand... No one, a goal judge never gets thrown out. It's no. like, oh, I checked his on ass. the one arm kid. You yeah, don't right. do that, right? right? Oh, I remember that. To, remember Revere. That I did that, that kid from Revere. I did yeah. that in yeah. Hockey East. Yeah. I mean, in um, Hockey, Hockey Night, Night Boston. Boston. Yeah. Boston. Um, but you, like, that, that's like just absolutely so hilarious. Yeah. Throwing out and a goal the judge. The goal judges were your best buddies. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 Hey, like be. I said, I started as one. Yeah. You were like... I remember, man, you fucking, your fingers on that button and you, you're sweating and you're like. <gasps> uh, my father yeah. used to bring us up to the, those regionals. Like he'd be like a, yeah. the psych guy and me and Sweeney would sit there and gold judge when we were in like college and high school and stuff. It was awesome. Yeah. But, you know, it, for there to be a breakdown between the four guys and you got to go to video, it, it, it's, you know what, the game, it, it's not perfect. Nope. So right. perfection you know, you can try to achieve it. Yeah, strive right. for perfection. And strive yeah. for perfection, but every game is 98, 99%. There's always something. But we always and say you, you can have a perfect game and someone's But that's just like off. playing too, right? Like when you're playing, yeah. you're going to be one or two two bad plays better than the yeah. other team. Right. Bad two, one or two bad yeah. calls better than the other team that night. Yep. But And we live in a fucking imperfect world. Yeah. So how the hell can you get... But you strive for it. And, you know, each year... Murph has a new kind of mantra for the season, and, you know, it's courage. Show some courage. I like that. Step yeah. up and show courage. And, you know, I can honestly say that watching, and courage, yeah. watching these guys perform at the level that they do each night, and it's not their profession, and I lived it, and I watch it now with these younger guys. Yeah. I mean, they're all young compared to a 61-year-old buzzard like I was at the end, but... What I'm saying is, you know, it's a lot to expect from a guy that worked his ass off during the day, went home to his family, or didn't go home to his family, and then showed up at the rink two hours ahead of time, getting mentally and physically prepared to go out and do a job that these kids and the coaches, the ADs, everyone's expecting perfection. And I think um, what Murph is trying to establish at Hockey East is to give the guys the best tools to succeed. Yes. Mm-hmm. So the use of video, again, he does as a teaching right. point to the guys, um, it's all on the table. Coaches see it. Video coaches see I it. I adopted the same thing in, ho- in Atlantic Hockey just like how he runs it, right? I sent yeah. everything I sent to the referees right to the coaches. Yeah. We're all on the same page. And Murph said to me at the beginning of the year, was like, some of these coaches know the rules better than the referees. It's called transparency. Yep. It's and so huge. Everybody's on the same page. And that part of the video use is a big plus because right. huge. You, you're trying to make the guys better. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Murph and I are night and day. I mean, he's a fucking giant and I'm a fucking <laughs> shrimp. And then, like I said, we have different opinions on different things when we look at clips or or plays in a game. And, and no offense to Murph, like Murph, Murph was a linesman. You're, you were a referee, yeah. and yeah. you know, linesmen, referees, 
even like Ke- like Kevin Collins, like he sees yeah. things different than than I would or whatever, yeah. right? And, and, and Murph is Brian thing. Murphy, who, right? Brian uh, Murphy yeah. retired yeah. from the NHL. I mean, two thousand USA Hall of Fame, two thousand games, and you know what? Murph has a he's one of the most respected guys that I've seen in this business in a long time. I would second yep. that. Um, and not we're only from, like, from, from administrators, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna pick his brain this this weekend, try to get him on. But don't like it. it <laughs> he, what, he'd be good. He'd he be would good. be great. What's interesting is so nowadays, and we see it in the NHL. You see it in in um, minor pro, but you also see it in D1 college. You described how you learned and earned your way through the process. I did the same thing. You did the same thing. Yeah. Now with the uh, amount of hockey. The number of games that got to get covered, and kids, and, and like the NHL just plucks pro players, puts them in the game, yep. and you a pulse. we have to push people along quicker than they should, and yep. that's why you, I personally think that's why you see so many fuck ups, in both or so many calls missed. You see it in the NHL, you see it in D1, too much, too soon. You see it, in D, you see it everywhere. You, juniors, you gotta go through the channels. You gotta go. But through the problem the is, you can't now because there's no. too much hockey and there's not enough refs. Well, and, I mean, go ahead. So, getting back to developing guys, I think now with USA Hockey and the junior level program, I guess I don't know. I haven't done it, but some of the guys coming up, they go out to the USHL. Well, oh, that's where I started with Chris Rooney, and we were out you there. That's where I, I went. Chris was. He was this little guy that would follow us to games and come to games. And Chris was, he was a sponge. To, and look yeah. at him now. He's, he's, he is. He couldn't iron a shirt, though, when he, we lived in Des Moines. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I ironed every shirt of his in, when we were in Des Moines. <laughs> but he's a, a, a good example of somebody that, that worked his ass off to get where he is. Yep. Nowadays, to get to the college level, you've got to go to USA Hockey, I think. You can't do it through the chapter and get nominated no. or get plucked by somebody. Well, there's no nom- there's no no more nominations. Anymore. So what happens what is referees crease is doing yep. one of our sponsors, by the way, referees crease. Um, there, I mean, you're developing it through. We got the we junior got the youth, the juniors, and, the and we got the college club. We got the D three. We got we got it all, and that's how we kind of work up. And you mentioned the USHL, Southern Pro League, yep, um, East Coast League. Right, like Johnny Grant just took over the USHL um, as one of the referees, supervisors, and good friend of mine, right? And we've already been, the second he got the job, we, we talked already, and we're all already talking about sharing guys for college yep. in, in June. So I'll send a couple of guys out to him, he'll send me a couple of guys for college, and then it's just that's you need you need some type of path or some type of road. There's no yeah. road right now. There's no, no path. There is. The, and the path There's no path be, at all for anybody. The, the path used to be pro or college. Yep. Like when I came, when I came up, it was either pro or college. You went the pro route or you went the college route. Yep. And I went the pro route, and then I came back to the college and did the ECAC for yep. a couple of years, right? Um, it, and and it, But it used to be kind of like you had to make a decision, and I unfortunately didn't last more than a week in the NHL, and so I came back to college. Now it's kind of, I don't even know what path there is. The, I think kids that are developing through the USHL have this dream that they can achieve that goal to the NHL. And then along the way, they're either getting kicked to the curb or that fork in the road comes. That's where yourself, Brian Murphy, Peter Fiola, Murph has his camp at Harvard. Yep. And these kids that are developing through USA Hockey into a higher level or trying to get to a higher level have to be noticed by those guys at a place like Murph's camp at Harvard or through the pipeline Mm -hmm. of the commissioners of that USHL, the Southern pro, all these crazy leagues that I don't even know about (laughs) that. That's where these kids are developing Mm -hmm. at the youth level, youth hockey. These kids are getting fucking blown up by parents, coaches, oh. and how do you take, you can't find a kid that's a 13, 12-year-old kid that wants to start. By the time he's 15, 16, he's saying, I don't need this shit. Right. And the other, the other here. well, you, you mentioned it earlier, right? How you started, you did Mike to Square, yeah. and, then, and then Pee Wee's. Like, these kids are starting now at 16, 17 years old. They're giving the finger to the Mites and Squirts. They're like, no, I want to do the Pee Wee's and the Bantams because they pay more, and they're not qualified. So, like, the Mites and Squirts are the ones suffering right now. And, and you know either. what? So, like, 
okay, well, is it the pay or is it the level, right? So which one is it, right? They're like, oh, well, it's the pay and or it's the level. So, and, right, and sometimes like, it comes down to what they're in it for. Right. Because we know guys that are in it for the check, right? And they're just there for the money. Yep. And you can tell, right? And then you got guys that have the passion for it, that want to be there, that want to do yeah. the best job. I, I want to bring out, you have, a, speaking of parents, crazy parents and crazy fans and whatnot, you, you had a little situation in Providence one time, didn't you? With a fan? Didn't well, yeah. fan? <laughs> <laughs> um, I love this story. You got to tell the story. So after the game, I was coming off with the old Zamboni entrance. Well, yeah, where the Zamboni was. And this guy comes around the side of the glass and, hey, Gravelisi, you fucking suck. Really? You think so, huh? Yes, you do. And he hut the fucking lungy right in my face. Oh, that's gross. And then I, I lost my marbles. I think Daddy O Taddio was there. Oh. And uh, there was who else was there? They had to hold me back. I went after him. I used a lot of expletives. I told him I had to get an AIDS test because of it. And I told him I was going to kill him. And they held me back. And he called me all kinds of names because they wouldn't let me get to him. And evidently, um, he was a season ticket holder who was observed by people there, and he got his season's ticket revoked. Good. And then I got a mysterious letter in the mail. Back then, it was put a fucking <laughs> stamp <laughs> right there. None of his email fucking stupid shit. <laughs> so I got a letter from this guy saying that he apologized. No blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow. like fucking spit right in my face. Oh, that's disgusting. Spit yeah, that's, right uh, in my, right, lungy, right, right in my... I mean, I've gotten stuff thrown at me, like drinks and whatnot, popcorn. Batteries. And, yeah. Batteries I haven't had a battery, Birmingham. but popcorn yeah. and drinks, yeah. Yeah, we had everything. Adirondack one night, yeah. yeah. Coming, like, you gotta, like, you gotta go through the gauntlet, like, there's like three or four people that hang up, and you gotta walk underneath, and they look right over you. And <laughs> one, one, one night, I was, I called a goal back. And that wasn't too good. It was the right call, I think. Yeah. I asked my father, and my father was act actually at the game. And I had no supervisor, whatever, right? One-man system, American League. I come in, I get the big wave, boom, the whole place goes nuts. It was goaltender interference, right? And they end up losing the game, and I'm off the tunnel. The popcorn, everything spitting, whatever. I, I don't know if they spit, but everything came at me. We get in the locker, and I'm like, I go, hey, Dad. I go, wow. Uh, was that a goal or what? He goes, He goes. I don't know, but I haven't heard a boo like that in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, awesome. I, I, well, we had, up in Birmingham, I called the Valentine's Day massacre because it happened on Valentine's Day. Um, and I won't get into the story. It's too long. I'll tell it sometime. Ooh. But suffice it to say, Birmingham was not happy with me. And I mean everything came on the ice uh everything they're rednecks what the hell are they know about <laughs> fucking well, i actually i actually picked up a nine volt battery and i went over to the glass to the bench and i go hey boys anyone need a nine volt <laughs> they threw that was the game that i got escorted out because it was like three thousand people in the yeah, parking yeah. lot waiting for me and uh it was it was an interesting game wow. but uh yeah but that was like violence they yeah, wanted they they were oh they wanted they, 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 they would have killed me you yeah, been late. Home, yeah you would have been the late. cops were walking me out and we had to take like two exits up the highway, not go right to the hotel because they were afraid people. Would, yeah. And I'm like, it's a hockey game. And and at the end of the day, I was right. Yeah. I mean, I handled it poorly, but I I, it, I was right. The call was right, but you know, hey, it happens. And right. uh, and he got so, it in real time. No fucking video. Yeah, no, re no, no, re no replay. No, yeah. no replay. No, no video. replay. I did have the goal judge though. To that, to their credit, the you let him stay. Story, <laughs> no, the goal judge. What's that? You I let, let him stay. stay. I did. I let him stay because they were all like in those in the East Coast League that back in the day. They were all local yahoos that were the goal judge. They yeah, were right. Fans. Someone would have the shirt. Oh on yeah, the, the team. team. Yeah, right? right. And this guy, to his credit, when I said, "Did did the did you see the puck in the net before my whistle?" and he said, "No, I didn't." To his credit, he answered me honestly. So there was no question. I didn't have it. The linesman didn't have it. The goal judge didn't have it. Yeah. And so. At the end of the day, the video, which was a VHS, um, that proved proved it right as best as it could. But yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's but to spit on someone, gross. I mean, yeah, that's that was part, yeah, that was the worst one crazy. I had was walking off Des Moines uh, in the USHL. I rink still up too. The, you walked off and there was a, a landing like right in front of you. Yeah, yeah. And um, that barn was one of the best barns. Still is. I mean, 4,000 people in there. And it's Dollar like bin. Oh, no. It's like 50 cent bin <laughs> night. Nuts, right? 50 cent bin night. So I'm walking off, and there's a, 
there's a woman, right, standing with like a toddler, holding a toddler, right? And she looks right at me. She goes, Riley, you suck cock. And I go, and I go nice mouth. Yeah. And I just nice. walk by. And I, I'll never forget that. The, and my, the linesman I was with, he, she, he goes, did she just tell? I go, yeah, I think she did. Yeah. I go, there's a kid destined for uh, some services. But... <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, uh, that's pretty good. That was my my craziest one. The boy was the best. They would all like there was a lady that worked up in the bar up upstairs, and you would have like a case of beer in your room, and then she would be standing there with three margaritas that would knock your socks off. Like you just come off a two hour you know wind sprint in the USHL. Like, no frap, was, no fraps back then. No, no. that was a, that was a track meet. No, you drank your Bud Light frap afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, it from the inside. Yeah, you, yep. you're, yeah, you're in you're you're in the locker room till till midnight. Then you go out to the bar, and then you go do it all over again. Yep. Now, so a uh, couple things that we've talked about. So when you started, did you wear a helmet? No. No. I and, went smokeless. And then, smokeless. <laughs> and, then, and then I had that, that like, the, the fro thing going. Well, you, you got know? some nice yeah, lettuce right now. Nice oh, I had, yeah. I had I, uh, liquid helmet. The Jones Brothers taught me about final. The best. Jones Aquanet. Brothers. Was it Aquanet? Oh yeah, aqua. yeah, the aqua. Yeah, Spray that dad. thing can take a puck. You wouldn't yeah, even get hurt. Yeah, no, I'd fall down. I'd yeah. bounce right back. Up. Oh, you guys shined your helmets and skates too. <laughs> yeah. Liquid helmet. We oh, call yeah. it liquid helmet. We sprayed that on everything. Yeah, hockey's first year. Couple Matter of years, fact, I think that was helmet. before Viagra, so you could use it for that too. It was that good. <laughs> then they put us in the bowling ball helmet. <laughs> the kazoo. Well, Remember the, kazoo, the, yeah, the kazoo. kazoo. I was the kazoo. First helmet. That was that was the, my first helmet I ever ref with. So Dana, um, what happened is. Um, we ended up, Greg Ash, who was the sales rep, God rest his soul, too. Ash Can was the uh, sales rep for Jofa. Okay, yeah. So all of a sudden, at one of our Hockey East meetings, here's this bunch of boxes filled with fucking Jofa helmets. I thought they were bowling balls. Like, what the Those fuck? Things were they ugly. look like a bowling so ball. Those things were ugly. We were told that the that was the helmet of choice. Um, it's okay. Comfy, though. So... We started wearing these things, and I, I'd put it on, and if I leaned one way, I'd fucking fall over. <laughs> and I looked the great kazoo. The great yeah. kazoo, So yeah. I went out and found me. Well, I had a broom ball Gretzky. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was my favorite helmet, but you weren't allowed. I mean, you could. they wouldn't let you wear it because it wasn't approved. Well, oh, Luke, yeah. Luke, Galvin, Luke still, Galvin, he still wore it up until his last American Hockey League. Yeah. He still wears it now. Yeah. He, he wears it now with a visor on it. I don't even know how he holds it on there. I don't care. So I found one that's in the middle. That guy, Mats Talene, played for the Bruins. So he yeah, had, yeah. But yeah. he had this Jofa in the middle. It was, wasn't a box cut, and it wasn't the round fucking bowling ball thing. So I had this medium look. Jofa, Mats Talene. And there I was fucking flying around one time and I got a phone call. Grav. <laughs> yes, Dana. Uh, your helmet um, looks a little different than the other guys. <laughs> and then, Dana, I'm sorry. That thing, I, it don't fit. I, I can't wear it. I, I need papal dispensation. Please help me. <laughs> Get me through this. Well, Grav, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to think about it. But for now, uh, yeah, you can keep wearing it. So I did wear that. But the the funny thing was high school hockey, you weren't you didn't have to wear a helmet. So that's crazy. During high school games, eventually I said, fuck it. If I'm wearing a helmet in college where the kids know where they're most of them know where they're shooting the puck and they're, and they're pretty good. In high school hockey, where it's more like fucking rollerball, yeah. I'm gonna wear my fucking helmet. <laughs> so I started wearing a helmet, and a few other guys did, and eventually, it became the, the you know, the normal, weapon yeah. of choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now the same thing with the visor. Yeah, how was that, that for you putting the visor on? Uh, my fucking schnott box got in the way. I <laughs> have Oakley make a. Special you had to get one. a special one, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, Oakley. Yeah, he's a fucking <laughs> fog up and shit. But no, uh, I, I I didn't mind the visor. It didn't bother me. Um, you know. Safety is number one, you know, F fair and safe. Keep the game fair and safe. Yep. But personal safety, I mean, I got opened up a few times. Um, Babson was a bad one. Paul Donato had to take me to the fucking hospital. Oh, and I was, you know, I got a puck in it. But things happen. Shit happens like right. that. Yeah, I got a scar on my nose, Sioux Falls. No, no visor. Kid just coming around. 
Yeah, stick, they, you were carrying it high, and it just bit me, right? Well, you know, Did you give him a penalty for high sticking? I should have. You should have. Well, yeah. you talk about the visors. My nose got in the way. You know, the NCAA, I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. It's not my deal, but. I'll let you know this weekend. <laughs> if they, Well, let's. I'm just going to say from someone that's been around for yeah. a little bit that the violent le- the violence level mm. sticks up high, play along the boards. If they went to a half shield, kids would realize I'm going to lose teeth and my eyes. There we, thank you. All right? We talked about this I'm before. I'm going to lose teeth and my eyes. So maybe I should be a little more careful around the wall or keep my stick fucking down. But the problem, I think, is that the first kid that loses choppers or loses an eye now has a gripe against the league or the NCAA because they changed the rule. Well, do you, do you think it would be a little bit more beneficial? All right, I lose a chiclet. All right, big deal. But now I get my, my noodle rattled three times. Now I'm, I'm done playing, right? Because every every hit, Gino. sometimes every hit in college is a penalty. No, I, I get it. I, I, I don't think it would ever fly because, first of all, you need – it has to be all or nothing, right? That's like, right. It has to be all or nothing. That's it right. Has to be, it has to be all. everybody without a visor. Because you can't do mix and match. Because if you do that, then you got kids out there not respecting it, right? The That's kids right. with the helmets well, on. Everyone's the over 18. And caught, well, well, most everyone is I think over everyone's 18. over 20 now, the way it is now. Well, yeah, everyone's <laughs> there's like 27-year-olds. But, yeah, but no, you're right. For the most part, you're very rarely going to see a 17-year-old kid in college hockey. But you have to go all or nothing. The kid at BU is 17, I heard. That, I think that so. That phenom that's supposed yep. to go first next year. Actually, um, Mike Arruzzioni was telling me about him. And I guess he's phenomenal. He's an Italian um, lad. Of course he is. You got the strong legs. That's what my mother used to say. You don't have Italian legs. You need Italian legs. That's no, he's a good player. Me. He's a good player. Yeah. Um, um, but but th- I was saying I think they should go to half shield. And when you know, you're in the East Coast League or, or American League, you, you knew right away when a kid was out of college. Because he's out there flying around with the twig in the air, clipping people, hitting people in the face. And it was only a matter of time before someone beat the bag out well, of him. Well, that's the thing. And he realized, i got to keep my stick down. Yeah. And then they respected they the themselves, fact, yeah. you know. They, yeah. And so, I don't know. I always, I've, I've said this for years, though, that college should go to a half shield. I'd love but, to see it because I think the violence level will come down. And, you know, not that it's going to make an official's job any easier. No. But what's going to happen is these kids are invincible at right. the cage. Yeah, they're tanks, and the equipment they have now it makes them faster, strong. Like you, there's, there's, it's lightweight shit, the, and the, the it takes from the speed so fast. Everything yeah. is so quick. It's the now. fraps, yeah. the fraps they drink. It's That's the fra- what it is. <laughs> it's the fraps. <laughs> it's the fraps. But I, I'd love to the I'd muscle love, milk. <laughs> I'd love to see him go to the yeah. to the hoffy and. See what happens, but that's not up to me. Maybe yeah, when you guys go out and, and have your meeting, maybe, you know, I you don't know, know what gets talked about. Bring it up. That's I'll definitely bring it up. About. Yeah. Uh, now, it, I mean, it gets brought up all the time. It, it gets shot down for all the reasons you said, too, right? Like, same deal. Like, the first first time someone loses an eye or, or teeth, like, well, why didn't you have a cage on? It's like, well, we did it because of this, that, and the other thing. And then it's like, well, so pick your poison. So I think, I think the cage on will probably be, in the long run, makes sense, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Now, so here's something that I, I definitely want to get your take on because Hockey East has been known for the personalities on the bench. You know, Jerry York, and you, you have... Um, yeah, Jack Parker, Jack Parker uh, Dick, uh, Umili. Umili. Like, Umili was the best. They so. were like, you know, they're almost like larger than life in college hockey, right? But you also had guys like yourself who, and we talked about this with Paul Stewart um, in the last episode, there was a personality... You knew what you were getting when Grav walked in the building. You know, with the four man, it's a little different now. Um, who was the most colorful coach you dealt with? The tree you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I, they, they 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 rank one two three. But Coach York came in after the fact because Coach Zaglowski was there first. Oh yeah, Zaglowski. Right. That's right. When I right. came I in, forgot about him. And and Richard came in. Richard was an assistant. Um, he wasn't at UNH at first. Right. Uh, Coach Holt was there at first. Then Coach Cullen, and then Richard came in, uh, Coach Humilly. Um But if I had to say those three, Coach Humilly, right? Yep. Coach Parker and Coach Walsh at that time, they were they were incredible. Really? Incredible. 
I bet you I forgot about Walsh. He was great. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, you know, they kept you on your toes. Um, the banter back and forth was awesome. It was great. Um, it, it was never, it never, I, I can say right with me, with me, it never got personal. Right. It never got to the point where, you know, I wanted to take him outside and beat the fuck out of him. No. <laughs> it was always 60 minutes of, of back and forth. And at the end of 60 minutes, it was over. Yeah. Back How then. should be. Um, it was a time when you could go out and have a few beers Locked with the early. guys, with the coaches. That's how it was. Um, back then, I mean, Coach Flamin, yeah, for any Coach fun. Riley, um, Coach McShane at Providence. Yep. I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Um, though that that was a time when those guys ruled the roost. Mm -hmm. Coach Zaglaski at BC. I mean. That was a great time for college hockey. Those guys were implanted. They were there forever. Yep. And, you know, when you took the ice to do their games, in order to get respect, you, you got to give it. it. Mm -hmm. You can't, you got to earn yep. it. You can't just fucking show up. And so they're going to test you. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the first time in all of those facilities with all those new coaches, new league that I'm in, you know, going from a goal judge to this little fucking linesman kid with no helmet on <laughs> feeling naked to the world uh yeah no it was it was um intimidating i'm Old not gonna lie time. to you it was intimidating because you read about these guys you saw them in action as a gold but then you finally get out there and once the puck drops all those butterflies go away and all that shit stops yep. but then once the banter starts and you watch other guys how they handle it so you watch a guy like like Turkey, McBride, yep. Folksy, how they handle it, how DeCap handles it, how Billy Stewart handles like you just watch these guys and you learn and you basically put it in your toolbox, all right? When I need to or if I have to, I see how they're handling things or how they operate during the course of a game. And I learned over time from watching and paying attention to those guys that you can you can't bullshit these you can't bullshit the coaches you got to know the rules number one and number two you got to be a person you can't be a phony you got to go out and interact and what murph called emotional intelligence you need to use that Such and a good term. what you have as a personality you can't you can't teach that kind of shit sometimes. Right. So your confidence level, how you interact, that comes from experience. Experience. Comes, yeah. It comes yeah. from experience. So, and rule knowledge. Like yeah. You've got to know the rules. There's times where you can diffuse situations. Um, and like I said, the first few years as a linesman, I just. What did they tell you? They kept. They told you to keep your mouth shut. Yeah. yeah. Just you keep your mouth watch. shut. Don't say nothing. Yeah. I, I just talked off the coach. Yeah. He talked about Coach Riley. Yeah. He sends me a text after every game, right? It's that and the other thing. Yep. Young linesman, give him some lip, right? Well, Riley probably deserved to be told yep. to be quiet, and he said that. He actually admitted that. He goes, he goes, if he goes, if the referee that's been around wants to say something, he can't. But not this kid. I'm not going to take lip from him. That. <laughs> that's he's so old school. And you know what? He, he's not wrong. He's it's not, like not he's fully wrong. No, he's not wrong. No. Like, just keep your mouth shut, right? And then when you get the time yep. and you get the and you get the clout you know and young young linesman just got in the american league just got in the east coast league you know he's working d1 game you know he's yeah. just finding his way yeah. you know like but to come out and you know start exploding on these guys or yeah it doesn't work no. No, you just sit back work. and then when the time's right usually if there was interaction it was you know a verbal fucking bob yeah. i mean coach walsh at Maine, first time I had University of Maine, who the fuck are you, sunshine? Where'd you come from? <laughs> I mean, I'll never forget it. Right. But, you know, these guys, they were animated. Coach Parker at BU, um, Coach Humilly, I mean, they took it to another level. And, you know, it's not that they, that was their part of their emotional makeup. Right. I mean, they were like intense on the bench and you got to feed off that emotion you can't go and in, in order to diffuse something that's like that you got to either use humor 
Yep. Which I have in the past. A little bit. Uh, sure. A few times. Um, yeah, more than a few <laughs> times. But you've got to at least let them know if you fucked up, then admit it. Right. Come clean. Yep. Or just say the truth. You don't make shit up. You, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. What do you God want is not written on the back of my fucking shirt. And if you let them know you're a fucking human in any job you do in mm. life, it, it, hey, come across as, as an honest you know, genuine person. And on the ice, it gets magnified because you're in front of 5,000 people that all think you fucking suck. Right. And then, you know, your um, confidence level builds up over time. And you can't teach that either. That's earned. It's it's, it's ex- through experience. Yep. And what McBride calls turf time. You need that time. Yes, turf time. To get, right. to yep. get honed into expecting the unexpected and when the unexpected happens you, how you, you can react it, how you handle it and um, let me ask you because i know you and and you're one of the funniest people i know i'll be honest i that, ain't a comedian you are minute. that <laughs> means a lot coming from <laughs> you me, wait right? a minute because i'm pretty goddamn. Funny. i know you are but, um did you ever not get the last word because the train honestly Pro hockey was the best training ground for me as a comedian because you always had a, I always had to have the last word. I would never let them get the last word. So you had to be. I you I, know? I would either shake my head and laugh and just go away without saying something yep. if if I thought I shouldn't say the last word. <laughs> right. Um. Let's see. Let me just think. So at UMaine, um, Coach Gendron was on the bench. And UNH was playing. That's a rivalry game. Big, you know, it's yeah. fucking crazy at that. Yeah. So at the end of the, one of the periods, wasn't the game. I think it might have been at the end of one of the periods. As we're all going off the same way. UNH goes towards our locker room door. Oh, yeah, you off, yeah. That little yeah. door. And then Maine goes off where the Zamboni is. So we're all kind of, I'm standing still and Coach Gendron asks permission, you know, as a gentleman, uh, so of course, I'm not going to say no. Of course, I'm going to go talk. So he asked me a question about something. And at the time, Coach Tortorella saw me going over that way. So he kind of, in his fancy Italian <laughs> shoes there, scuffled across <laughs> the, the ice to where I was talking to Coach Ginger. Coach Ginger asked me a question about something that happened in a period. And at the end, he walked away. And Coach Tortorella looked at me and says, Grav, you are so fucking full of shit. <laughs> I said, what did you say? I go, I ain't full of shit. I'm fucking Italian. I'm full of sausages and fucking peppers, you fucking jabron. <laughs> and he just looked at me, shaking his head, and he, fuck, he didn't know what to say. And off he went. <laughs> True story, honest to God. Um, you know, to get to do what you guys have done, and what I've done, you know, there's shit, there's steps to get there. But then, you know, in order to do this, you got to make sure the shit at home is right. All right. I mean, I've had three kids, two fucking dogs, one dog passed away. But you got shit going on at home. Yeah. And then you got to maintain the relationship with your wife. And Debbie, you know, she, I've been with her for 30 something years, 31 years. And. She's accepted the fact that this is what I did for fun. But, you know, it puts some money in your pocket, but mm-hmm. you don't. What you guys said earlier, there are guys that do it for the dough. Right. I did it because I love being with you guys. I love the whole thing. Right. And that's and why it, you were one of the best. I mean, let's be honest. You, I, you did it for the I, right reasons. I, I did. I, I can say, I, I'm not going to say that I was one of the best. I had fun doing what I did. But I learned from all the guys how to get there. And what you do at home is you got to have your shit together at home before you can even attempt to pack your bag and go. Right. And for a guy that works during the day, comes home and tries to get mentally prepared to go do these fucking games, and then physically prepared, you know, it, it takes a lot. And then once you start, like I said, the first few years, I was single and out of my fucking mind. <laughs> and then what happens is Dana used to say it. Grab. The best thing that happened to you was Debbie. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, 
things change. Yep. So now you get married, you have kids, yep. and your whole thing revolves around that little world you got at home. And then as the kids get older, you got to go to their stuff. You can't miss it because I can honestly say I miss that shit now because I'm not, I don't have to go yeah. to games 100%. or they're, they're, whatever they're doing. And, you know, you got to give them that time too. I mean, there were times, yeah, when my kids would have hockey games at the youth level and I couldn't be there. I was traveling and I was somewhere else. Um, but for the high school stuff, when it got, you know, really yeah. to the nitty gritty, I was always there for them. I would X my, and all the supervisors that we had, right, from Dana to Brendan to DeCap to Dan, every time I'd get my schedule, or before the schedule came out, I would look at my kid's schedule and I would X my, and they all said the same thing, Grav. I says, I'm sorry, I'm going to X, I'm taking myself out. And they said, Grav, we expect that. That's what you're supposed to do. Right. I mean, I've seen too many guys in this thing lose jobs, lose family. Because they put this ahead of all that other shit. Right. This is a it. It's considered a hobby for us. It's not our profession. Right. But I have, and I know a lot of the guys that still do it have a lot of fucking fun doing it. And the guys that are in it for the right reason do survive and have a lot of fun and get the most out of it. So as the men's ice hockey officiating coach. <laughs> That's one of the Official things title. that I stress. I, I love watching these young guys do the right thing at home or, or and then come to the rink. And, you know, that's what you, we've been preaching too. Yep. Right. And, you've, always, you've always stressed that. Like just running into you at those like any, anywhere, just running into you throughout the year. You always said, are you having fun and how's your family? Like you always ask me those two questions every time I see you. It's the most important thing. Yep. And, you know, when my kids get old enough to go to games – they were coming with me. Right. Jonathan, I remember Jonathan would come to the games. He couldn't even fucking see over the glass. <laughs> his head would be up by the dash, like looking up. And then Matty G, his first game he went to, he almost started a fucking war. <laughs> <laughs> Some guy at UNH started giving me shit. Said, Gravelisi, you fucking sock. Blah, blah, blah. Now, I didn't know any of this. I'm on the ice. Right. The end of the first period, the door comes flying. Now, I took... Maddie and Jonathan with me because Jonathan had a game on Saturday morning at a rink in Concord, New Hampshire, on six, at 6 in the morning. And I said, look, I'm doing the game at UNH. It was against North Dakota. So after the game, Ooh, baby. here's what we'll do. We'll cut across 101. We'll get a hotel, and we'll wake up in Jonathan's games right there. Maddie, this will be your first game. This will be great. Fucking now, how, guys how night old, out. How old are they? Jonathan was a squirt. Okay. So he was, what, like eight? Yeah, Matty G was probably mm -hmm. about five, right? Six? I don't know, somewhere in there. Nine, yeah, yeah. nine and five. Not you know, there's a f difference between them. But anyway, <laughs> do the game, and I'm on first period. After the first period, the door fucking flies open. Jonathan comes on. Dad, you ain't gonna fucking, you ain't gonna believe what just. And Matty G comes right in behind him. Dad, this guy in the stands said you suck, and he fucking gave me the double bird. Fuck. I turned around. I said, "Fuck you." That's my dad. And he turned around and gave the guy the double bird. I'm like, Matty, what did you do? Yeah, that guy said you suck. So I said, "Fuck you." That's my dad. I, I gave him the double bird right back. I'm Shocking like, oh, that your God. Boy, kid of yours would react that way. <laughs> <laughs> Matty G. So, over time, UNH became his favorite team. Um, that work, man? Coach Humili was his idol. So, in like first grade, you're supposed to do a report or whatever the fuck on a famous American. <laughs> not Georgie Wash, not A.B. Lincoln. Fucking Richard Humili. Really? Oh, yeah. He had a dress like Richard, wore a turtleneck. <laughs> <laughs> did a presentation you before he left the house <laughs> oh, he, but he uh he ate and slept he loved unh hockey and i'd bring him all the time coach humili loved him he'd go in the room with the kid you know he'd bring him i'd bring him to the games and i didn't have to worry about him he'd be fine and um he ended up going to unh and he became there he came mm -hmm. as him at games. coach humili's last game he was the he became well coach humili's last year Maddie was their video coordinator. And then he stayed on his remaining three years at UNH. And I guess he's pretty good at what he does. Hmm. He loves what he does, or he loved what he did. And, um, you know, he could have pursued it and, and ran with it. 
But he said, Dad, why would I want to live out of a suitcase, never be home and make thousands when I can go to Wall Street and make millions? Smart. And you know what? Matty G, he's got a good gig going. Good for yeah. you. Um, he's well respected in the, 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 he made a lot of good contacts. And I always told him, never burn a bridge because you never know oh, yeah. where you can end up. But that's a whole other aside from what we've been talking about. But I just wanted to at least touch on the fact that you can't be successful on the ice without making sure all your shit off the ice is so important. Is so together. true. Yeah. You know. So true. So your son's doing well. Does he? Is he any any interest in sponsoring a podcast? Perhaps. Um, <laughs> let's, <laughs> just asking for a friend. He pays rent. <laughs> I know that. All right. Um, but I still pay his fucking phone bill. How the fuck does that happen? I, 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 yeah, my two funny. of my kids still in my plan. They're my like wife says 20s. we get a better deal on the family plan, and I don't even have a fucking phone in the plan. You know how to text? <laughs> I can text. Yes, I can. But homie, don't go near he does those. Text. I do. Your Texas. text, sir. I laugh out loud when I read your text because oh you actually spell words phonetically, like the way like I talk. You, yeah. And it's, I, then how else do you fucking spell them? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't spell them regularly. I spell them the way I talk them. The, 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 you oh, sent me a message the other day, and I was like, I, I just started laughing. I was like, this, this is priceless. there's nothing wrong and I with that. Hear you saying it? No, it's fantastic. That was I a good night the other it. night. Yeah. Uh, but that's how I've always done it. You should see the fucking proposals I send to people at work. They, oh, they, oh. I mean, if I could just write them on a napkin and say, here you go, I, I, I love that. But no, they want it in writing, triplicate fucking uh, emails. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I don't know if we could. I don't know if we could find a better ending than no. that right there. No. Um, grab man, I, this was awesome. This so happy that you could join us and uh, Miles. I loved I mean, it. This, this was awesome. great. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna down like two cannolis when we're done. Go right ahead. We're done here. Um, but hey, I'm ready to go to Vegas. Start drinking some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta wait till I get there. <laughs> I can't. Hey, Vegas, I can't thank you yeah. enough for allowing me to come here. This is. I'd, I'd come up here just to hang out with you guys. You don't have to put me in front of the cameras. I could sit over there and make faces. And drink. You keep bringing wine and Zambuki. You well, can come maybe every week. next time some chicken cutlets, some veal cutlets. Who knows? I, I'm, I'm into that. Yeah, let's do for it. Sure. No, it, 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 we we revere you yeah. not only as a referee because you've done so much, but you're one of the best guys in this business. And I, I don't say that because you're on my podcast because um, I, I don't have to say it because you know I got you here already. Um, <laughs> I mean it. Like you're but, one of the best guys in the yeah, business. And I, I gotta say, just just like you said, I've known you since I've been in diapers, and you know, I'm, I'm still learning from you, and I still, I still love you to death. Well, and, you Gino, know, you're, you're, the best, you're, the best, high, you're the best. You're the best. You're the best. He gets me out of all the high meetings too. Yeah, Riles texted me the other day. I didn't go to that I meeting either. I didn't go either. <laughs> No, I you get I, checked off though. Yeah, yeah we we both got <laughs> checked. We both got got excused. But no, I, I this is I'm humbled um, to be here. Um, this is a great thing you guys got going, and mm -hmm. you know it's good for the officiating community. Um, I know this. I do things a little different, or I did things a little different sometimes, but I did it because it was all. It appeared to be the right way to do things. Mm -hmm. um, the teachers that you had growing up in this thing, you know, you you know the guys that you want to emulate. You follow their lead, and it's no different now. Um, so what I'm doing. With, with Brian, you know, I'm learning from Brian. I mean, mm. I'm not bullshitting. People, you know, uh, no. I watch the way he operates, and I've worked for, you know, the f previous supervisors. And in no disrespect to any of them, but what he's doing now in this day and age with technology and the, uh, the win at all costs, you know, the way the teams are now, the leagues are set up, Brian has taken it to a new level. And technology with all this video stuff, unfortunately, it's the way to lead the, the hockey world's going with based on in play reviews mm -hmm. with video. But the technology to teach and bring guys it's so valuable to a to another level. You, you know, you can't just be complacent. Every game they should learn. You should learn something and I take agree. it away with you. And if this podcast helps other guys that. I don't interact with that maybe they'll get that message. That's the whole that's the whole point. And that's it. pretty good, you know. Um and don't think that just because you're not, you know, in Brian's line of fire right now or Gino's line of fire to to step up and become a college official. If you really want to do it, just 
fucking push yourself. Get to the where you got to be noticed. Get in, on the phone. Talk to people that can help you move ahead. And if you want to be an official and, and do well at it, then, you know, pursue it. Don't be afraid. What you put into it is what you'll get out of it. Exactly. And, and anything a, you do in life. Don't be afraid to show up with a box of cannolis. Right. That never hurts. <laughs> so uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for this right episode. On. That was awesome. Um, thank you. So uh, we want to thank our sponsors, as always, uh, Moby Cuts. Uh, right here in Beverly uh, with Cam and Eric. I want to thank uh, AOA Studios for having us. Um, and Z and Mike and Cam, uh, this place is top notch. This place is awesome. Um, our Could producer, well Josh you Stolen, and, uh, and you guys for listening. If you're listening, you can actually watch us on YouTube, Chirping yep. Zebras, uh, our Chirping Zebras channel on YouTube. We're on all the Do social media. Do I need media's. an app for that? <laughs> you How need, do I get that? You need help with that one. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get you. We'll on email it to you. Worry. Well, I'll get a, you can send me a, a CD? Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a, a VHS tape. You can throw it I in. I got that too. <laughs> your 8-track. It'll go with your I listen to the, <laughs> I listen to the monkeys coming up. <laughs> Daydream believer. <laughs> this episode is going to be 20 minutes. And uh, the ending is going to be... Two, no, we're, we're so happy. Thanks, Grav. Uh, Gino, you're the best. And thank you guys for joining us and uh, listening and watching. And we're going to see you next time right here on Chirping Zoom. <laughs>